Hello there, YouTubers. This is Gus Astacio, back at it again from Healing X Outreach Radio. Check us out at www.blogtalkradio.com backslash Healing X Outreach. If you were uh, to listen to this past Saturday's podcast, if you're on iTunes, you can subscribe to us. We had Carl Mickens, and uh, I think this Saturday coming up, we're doing... Uh, I think we're going to have a former Mormon, multi-generational Mormon. In fact, her roots goes way back to, um, oh, it goes along, it goes all the way back to the days of Joseph Smith and um, his uh, vision that he had, one of the three eyewitnesses to his vision. So um, I forgot her name, but I think we're going to, it's early in the morning here, Sunday morning, and I'm a little just got off work I'm a little bit exhausted but felt the need to do this video I, I did a Facebook live on this very topic and uh, sometimes Facebook gets more my attention than YouTube but um, especially lately and I haven't done many YouTubes lately but it's been getting busy and a lot of things have been happening but uh, as you know I think I gave my update video already but we have over 500 subscribers and uh, we're going to be doing something a little special because I like to let people a little, know a little bit about my life after uh, we've had 500 subscribers. So I'll, I think I did something on Facebook. I'm going to do it on YouTube and, and you guys will see it in the next couple of weeks. But um, I think uh, I'm going to be going to Washington State to see my buddy Julian, Marcus Julian Watson going to see uh, my buddy Jack Poley and uh, new a new friend of mine, Larry Mears. And Larry Mears and Marcus, we're going to do a Saturday broadcast in the next two weeks uh, from Marcus's house. And um, we're going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to get to meet Phil Fernandez. I, I've met him before, but I mean, I didn't know that he lived in Bremerton, Washington, which was close to Julian. So we're going to see a lot of ex-witnesses, a lot of people in apologetics, go to church, you know, play a little, have a little bowling, a little mini golf, have a little fun, guy, you know, guy stuff that we get to do. But today's video is about uh, Jeffrey Jackson. Now, um, you guys know Jeffrey. I call him Jeffrey Toys R Us Jackson. You know, Jeffrey was the draft and Toys R Us, which by the way is going to get reopened, which I'm happy for that. I'm a Toys R Us kid, but not like Jeffrey. Jeffrey uh, Jackson from the governing body, Toys R Us, you know, he got married to a real young wife because he likes his toys. <laughs> Jeffrey Jackson, he likes some young, young wife. Well, she's, well, she's got to be at least 40 years younger than him. I think he's got to be in his 60s or 70s. She's got to be in her 20s. So I think Jeffrey Toys R Us Jackson is appropriate. But lately, uh, Jeffrey was on JW.org, and um, this is kind of a reply to some of the things that he said on there about the divine name. And many people don't know that um, some things that he said was really it's not new news, it's old news. They try to, you know, give a wow factor about the divine name. Saying that, all oh, they found this manuscript and there the divine name was in it and, and it's the Septuagint and that's old news. Come on, we've known, you know, for many, many years the Septuagint Bible has the divine name. So, but well, what's the big deal about the Septuagint? Does that legitimize putting the name Jehovah in the New Testament? Of course it doesn't. It doesn't. You know why? Because, guess what? The Septuagint, which has a divine name, which is the YHVH, in the Greek manuscript, and it's Greek, is not of the New Testament. It's the Old Testament. So, you know, they like to... They like to prey upon the ignorance of many people. And, and we, I see this all the time in the scholarly community. You know, 
you'll have like shows like Lost Books of the Bible. Ooh, Lost Books of the Bible. And people think, oh, see, you know, all this, there's no, it's no Lost Books, people. When you know about the Bible and its formation, you know that, you know, shows like Lost Books of the Bible is, it's Boulder Dash. It's Bologna. You know what? Uh, I'll tell you, there are two books of the Bible that we have not found and probably will never find. And one of them is a fraud because uh, the, 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 the book of Jasher, okay? The book of Jasher, it's not, it's not you know, if, if you find a book of Jasher, it's not the book of Jasher, okay? It's it's a fraud. It, it's not even. I think it was it's a fraud that was made in the 1400s by a bunch of Brits. I think I think the Mormon Church is the one that published it. And the Mormon Church is didn't come around until the 1800s. So I mean, it just tells you if you see a book of Jasher, it's just a Mormon wannabe passed by a copy of really a book that was written by a bunch of Brits in the 1400s. It's nothing authentic about it. It's nothing ancient about it. it. It sounds really like good old King's English. But there's no manuscripts of the book of Jasher. There's no manuscripts of the book of Jebulees. And if there, if there were, you would have found it in the Greek Septuagint. But they're not in the Greek Septuagint. So let me explain a little something about the divine name and about three manuscripts that are thrown around. You have the Hebrew Masoretic text, okay? You have the Aramaic Targums or the Peshitta. And then you have the Greek Septuagint. All right? And we're going to do a we're going to do a podcast in January, me William, who's a Catholic apologist and David Witten, who probably by now has his PhD in history. <clears throat> and he himself is Eastern Orthodox. So we're going to have David, me, and uh, William. We're going to talk about these three manuscripts so that you can get familiar with them and what, what their relation to and how old they are and, and uh, you know, what's the big hullabaloo. And, and, and what's, what's really funny is that you have a Hebrew text, a Masoretic text. You have the Aramaic Peshitta or the Targums and which were made over time. The Masoretic text actually was was probably completed in the second century. The the Aramaic text was beginning beginning in the second century possibly. I think it didn't really find completion until around the fourteenth century. And then you have the Septuagint. And out of these three texts, the oldest of the three texts you would think would be the Hebrew. No. Maybe the Aramaic. No. The oldest of these three texts is the Greek Septuagint. The Septuagint is the oldest of the three lang linguistic texts that we have of the Old Testament. We, in fact, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, guess what they found? They found in the Dead Sea Scrolls copies of the Septuagint. And um, so that just tells you how old the Septuagint is. So what Bible did Jesus read from? Well, this is, this is the argument that Jeffrey Toys R Us Jackson is trying to make. Well, they found the Greek Septuagint and it has the divine name in it. Yeah, that's great. But that's common knowledge for those of us who know about biblical texts. It's not, it's not big deal. It's not, woo, yeah, that's a huge discovery. This is the thing, the nail in the coffin on Jeffrey's argument. You see, they want to legitimize the insertion of the name Jehovah in the New Testament. And the way they did it was not because of the Septuagint having the divine name in it, because we know, like I said, the Septuagint is the Old Testament. So what justified the insertion of the divine name in the New World Translation Bible, whether it's the Silver Sword or it's 1950 
separate volumes copies. It was the usage of a thing called the J versions or the Hebrew versions. Now that sounds old. Hebrew versions, right? Hebrews, the Hebrew versions or the J versions are not old. It's actually copies of a translation that was made by, get this, the Trinitarian Bible Society made the Hebrew versions or the J versions. And uh, yes, they inserted the name Jehovah in the New Testament in this translation of the Bible, which is called the Hebrew versions or the J versions. And the oldest copies of the Hebrew versions, I think, are dated around the 1600s, which is close to a little bit after the King James Bible was formed, and as young as the 1800s. Because uh, the reason why the divine name was included in the New Testament was the Trinitarian Bible Society, Trinitarians, wanted to be able to show the association of Jesus with Jehovah. And so what did they do? They did what the New World Translation, Translators used as a model for their insertion of the uh, name Jehovah in the New Testament. Wherever the Old Testament, well, not all, not wherever, because they didn't do it wherever, but wherever the Old Testament has a divine name and is quoted in the New Testament, they put in the name Jehovah, but they didn't. In fact, the Hebrew versions... Um, there were 50 occurrences where the J versions or the Hebrew versions had inserted the divine name in the New Testament that the New World translators didn't. So they actually omitted the divine name from the New Testament and the very thing that they used as a basis for inserting the New Testament. What does this have to do with the Greek Septuagint? Once again, Jeffrey Jackson is pulling a bait and switch or trying to impress people but the insertion or the inclusion of the divine name which is not the name Jehovah it's the tetragrammaton YHVH <clears throat> was in the Septuagint Bible which has been common knowledge for a long time now because it's the Old Testament it's the Old Testament, and it's not the name Jehovah, it's just those four consonants. So, the insertion of JHVH in the Septuagint does not justify the name Jehovah in the New World Translation's New Testament. It's smokescreen, it's baloney. There are no lost books of the Bible, people. That's the other thing. Today's message is... There are no lost books of the Bible. The book of Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Gospel of Mary, uh, all of these books are from a collection called the Nag Hammadi Collection. They're Gnostic writings. And they're Gnostic forgeries. They have the name Thomas and Bar Barabbas or Barnabas or, or the name Mary or the name Peter because those were, those were very popular names. Maybe someone might think that was written by the Apostle Peter. Maybe Mary did write the Gospel of Mary. It's just a way of passing on a fraud by using a name which would have been popular in the Christian community. And so the Gnostics would try to pass these books on, but those who knew the Apostles could identify the frauds. In fact, if you have uh, Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, he talks about Bishop Serapion. And Bishop Serapion is a second century bishop. And he comes across a copy of a book called The, uh, the Gospel of Peter. And uh, so somebody passes this on to him, and they want to get his opinion on it. And so he reads it, he examines it, and he comes back and he says, it's a forgery, it's a fraud. Um, and the reason why he knew this is because he, the doctrine was not the doctrine that Peter taught. And, and how would he know that? Because, because he was mentored by the man who was mentored by the apostle Peter. And so he knew the doctrine of Peter. 
He knew Peter's writing style because he is a descendant of the man who was mentored by the Apostle Peter. And that's why the writings of the Apostolic Fathers or the Antonicene Fathers are pertinent and important because their witness is an eyewitness to what the Apostles actually believed and wrote. So, Jeffrey Jackson is just throwing a smokescreen at you. When you see these things, Lost Books of the Bible, and you hear about the Gospel of Barnabas or, or Peter or whatever, it's baloney. It's just a bunch of for forgeries that were being passed around at that time. Now, there is a distinction between three, well, actually, between the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible the Eastern Orthodox Bible, the Catholics, and the Protestants. The Protestants use the Masoretic text. And uh, we will detail why that is important and why that there are only 66 books in the Protestant Bible in January. The Catholic Bible, of course, has 73 books because it includes the Deuterocanon. That is, some of the books of the Old Testament that are not included in the Masoretic text because the Masoretes uh, had a limited uh, canon of the Old Testament. The canon of the Old Testament that's in the Septuagint included more books. So the Catholic Bible will have First and Second Maccabees, it'll have Tobit, it'll have Baruch, Ecclesiasticus, the Book of Wisdom, those books from the Old Testament written during the um, a Babylonian captivity um, before Jesus was born. The Eastern Orthodox has, I think, one more. It has the book of Third Maccabees and I think a couple of excerpts of Solomon, <coughs> Solomon's writings, or and uh, and some verses missing from Daniel. And of course, the Ethiopian Orthodox has any one books and. I say the Ethiopian Orthodox has any one books because the Ethiopians are very superstitious people. So they fear leaving anything out. And so in the Ethiopian Orthodox, you'll have the Book of Enoch so, and, and, and the pseudepigraphal books. Not just the apocryphal books, but the pseudepigraphal books, which are absolutely rejected as sacred scripture. They're valuable stories, but they're not... They're not um, of the Old Testament. And uh, there's a reason why the Septuagint has a certain number of books, and we'll discuss that in January. So I, this is just a little thing on the divine name, okay? Don't listen to Jeffrey Toys R Us Jackson. He's throwing a smoke screen. There's nothing significant about this discovery of the Septuagint having the divine name that justifies the New World Translation or the New World Translators having the name Jehovah in the New Testament. It's baloney, and it's just, um, it's just a smokescreen, just a distraction, okay? And, and, and it sounds good if you don't know what he's talking about, but when you, when you know what he's talking about, then you realize that he's full of Oscar Mayer baloney. All right, that's it. We have 18 minutes in. I just wanted to share that information with you guys. Uh, listen to us this Saturday as we will have the testimony of a Mormon whose uh, genealogy goes all the way back to the three witnesses of Joseph Smith. You all have a blessed day. Bye-bye.